Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. I want to start today's show by paying tribute and extending our condolences to the family of Anne Deersley Vernon. She was a civil rights fighter, an artist, and an educator, and a personal friend of mine, and she lived a very, very full life. Anne was one of a few white students who actually went uh, joined students from North Carolina A&T State University at the Woolworth sit-ins in the 60s. And as a result of their actions, uh, Woolworth actually changed its policy about serving African Americans in the store. So she um, did a lot for the Crisis Museum, um, and she just loved the YWCA and many other organizations. And so we just want to extend our condolences from the family here at Another View. Beth Thomas Cohen says she is the first of her friends to get married, get pregnant, and start her own business. And she would share details of her life to her friends through email. But then she moved from the personal to musings about things happening to her and around her, like how much she despises stick figure family decals on the back of minivans. She looks at the struggles of modern womanhood with wit and candor in her book, Drop the Act, It's Exhausting. Please welcome Beth Thomas Cohen to Another View. Hi, Beth. How are you? Hi, Barbara. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. I have to tell you, I stayed up last night and finished the book and laughed <laughs> all the way through it. It really is. Yeah. It really makes you think and makes you look at yourself, but it's it's really amusing, too. Good. I'm so <laughs> glad. It's, it's a discussion topic book. <laughs> Absolutely. It is. So explain to our audience exactly what you mean by Drop the Act. I, I mean, it's on so many levels. It means so many things. But for me... It's kind of embracing those imperfections in our lives and feeling okay with, you know, improper thoughts about love and marriage and self-esteem and race, which is, and judgment, which are my two favorite topics in the book, <laughs> um, and not really feeling like you have to be, feel like you have to say sorry because you feel a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I feel like if you're, if you do that, you're kind of less accept, more accepting of others and more loving and accepting of yourself. And when you really strip down and, you know, accept who you really are. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of the way that I see it. So it's it's all about being honest, not only with yourself, but also with others. Yeah. And I feel like I always issue a disclaimer because people are like, oh, honest. And I don't mean honest, like thou shall not lie kind of honesty. (laughs) I mean... You know, because people are like, I'm like, yeah, have you lied? Yeah, I've definitely lied in my life before. <laughs> but, like, it's the truth in terms of relaying um, how you really feel and, and always, you know, from a place of yes, not from a place of no, mm-hmm. and with couth. Um, But it's a communication thing and making sure that whatever you're conveying is a true message. And I just always looked for that whenever I had a different kind of pivotal moment in my life, whether or not it was having kids or, or getting married or um, succeeding in career life or whatever it was, I just kind of always looked for the truth on mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. and the real deal. And I think the only time I ever felt like I could really get some sort of truth, which is ironic because I was on her show, was like Jenny McCarthy's book about called Belly Laugh. Uh-huh. Um, this is 100 years ago, but she was one of the people that just kind of laid it all out there. And that was the only resource I could find, and that was only about pregnancy. So that wow. was a, yeah. clearly not enough for me. <laughs> Absolutely, because <laughs> you, t- you, you touch on many, many topics. But I'm curious as to whether you think your ability to really just call things as they are has something to do also with your upbringing. Can you tell tell our audience about you growing up and, and what you had to face, which made a difference, I think? Yeah, oh, my God. I, I, I You know, I really don't think I could have I, – I don't think I could cu- sit here – and write a book and discuss these things had I not um, come from my background and all those kinds of things because I've been in so many different sectors. Mm-hmm. So without all of that experience, I wouldn't feel like I had a lot to say that was warranted for people to listen. Um, I was actually shocked people wanted to listen. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, you know, um, I come from a multi-racial uh, background and cultural mm-hmm. background, for that matter. My mom is white and my father is black. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I went and complicated the situation and married a Jewish boy. <laughs> so, <laughs> As I you thought, put it, the United Nations. To, <laughs> truly, like it's the United Nations. And I thought, oh, well, if I'm already dealing with the black and white thing, why not deal with the religious thing too? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it for sure. And I came, I'm a product of divorce. Mm-hmm. Um, I have half-sisters, a real brother, stepmother. I mean, I have every every different, I don't know, you know, I think, like, I'm probably somebody's worst nightmare. But for me, it worked in my favor, and I think that for sure shaped my view um, on the world. Because mm-hmm. even when you were in private school, they're, they're, at some point you found that you were, quote, different than the other uh, students you were going to school with. Weird because it's totally ironic. I my father grew up in the Upper East Side um, in the projects in the Riverton projects mm-hmm. and got an academic scholarship to a prestigious prep school by the name of Horace Mann in Manhattan in the Bronx. And my mom grew up in the Midwest with tons of money and went to private school. And then they came and migrated over to the tri-state area outside of Manhattan. And I think their thinking was. A, we both went to private school and were very fortunate enough that she could, but I think they kind of wanted to shelter me from the public school area because I would be so different. Mm -hmm. So their thinking was throw me in this kind of academically forced uh, school and then that will be what she will focus on and they'll focus less on race. And I do think that, that it was that way. I think, but as I got older and realized the other part of the world didn't work that way was when I was like, oh, okay, maybe not. Maybe (laughs) maybe somewhere around the time you started dating? (laughs) I mean, you know, probably, yes. Yeah, when I started, you know, yeah, I mean, when I was, I would say, I don't know if I was dating because I think my mother would have a heart attack to know that I even kissed a boy at the age of 13. I was actually younger, but, you know, probably at the age of like when you have interest in boys and you're trying to develop your sense of self with other peers and things like that. Mm-hmm. So like 13, 14, 15, those pivotal, horrific, disgusting years um, yes. that I'm not looking forward to dealing with my own kids <laughs> was when I was it was a little like, oh, okay, I guess not everybody can just be friends with everybody for who they are, which is what I was always taught, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think I realized, I don't know, I remember sitting in math class with, um, with an African-American classmate who I thought was my friend, um, and she turned to me. She got annoyed with something that I said having nothing to do with anything, and she said to me, oh, come on, you know, you just shut up lightly toasted. Ah. And it, it took me a second, though. I'm like at me like I just my head was in not in that space and I thought I really to-? I'm like oh my god is she talking about me and I just thought to myself wow that was kind of not cool yeah <laughs> you know exactly like, is that how you see me is that how you see me because I'm not black enough and then with white people I wasn't I was too black <laughs> I mean it was just like it was, I don't know you know I think it all it for sure shaped my um my view on everything, on everything, you know? I think prep school helped me because, yes, you're focused on the academic, and if you pay to go there, nobody really cares what you, who you are, you know? Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you can only keep yourself um, sheltered for so long. So why do you think women in particular have such trouble um, being their authentic selves and, and instead would prefer to keep the act, if you will? Because we have a totally screwed up society. <laughs> I mean, like our society, I mean, this is like a whole nother book. I, 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 I mean, it's just anything, equal pay. I mean, I just, it's, there's so many, so many, many, many things with women running companies. I mean, it's just the most ridiculous thing. I was fortunate enough to work in an industry that's very female oriented, which I probably chose inadvertently without even realizing it, but, you know, seeking it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that women feel like they need to conform for acceptance. And for some reason, we feel like our value is only brought by acceptance. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, you know, they, it just it just doesn't it, it doesn't resonate to people that we can just be who we are. And if people don't accept that, then, OK, move on. You know, it's, it's how we are set up as a society and and given social media um, and, and life pressures and all those things in, in the world. Um, you know, it's just gotten it's just gotten increasingly worse. So, do you think that social media has has put even more pressure on people to oh. be something other than they are? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm not even on Facebook. I'm the last person on the Facebook planet. I'm in the media, and I am not on Facebook. 
Uh, I'm yeah, on there, but I don't like, go on, there on a daily basis. I have to be And that's be what everybody <laughs> says. Yeah, and everyone says that to me. They're like, you don't go. I'm like, it's, yeah, I mean, it's just, I have a nine-year-old whose friends, first of all, I'm not that mom, so I'm issuing a disclaimer. I'm not judging you moms if you're these moms, but I'm not the mom that's having the nine-year-old with a phone on social media. Like, I'm just not doing it. Maybe I'm more entrenched in it because I work in the media and I really know what goes on, but I'm not. And I have, my daughter has friends on Instagram and Facebook and, you know, posing. I just, it's the, the focus and the emphasis is in the wrong place in society anyway, and social media has exacerbated that to the point where it's just, you know, ridiculous. I think it's a necessary evil. I am an Instagrammer for sure. I think mm -hmm. I like the fact that people can't talk to me there. You just see pictures, so I don't have to hear anybody's political views or uh, societal views or anything. I just want to vomit when I read. But <laughs> I think at the same time, I put out a good day or a bad day. I'm not a smoke and mirrors girl. So... When I get a 4D facial because I just turned 40, that picture is up there. <laughs> you really it's do come there. out and show your it's authentic really stuff. <laughs> yeah, or if I'm having, like, you know, a not-so-cool day, I'm not putting up a quote about how blessed and beautiful everybody and my life is. I'm putting a quote up there saying, like, I hate everyone. I, there's not enough wine in the world to make me feel better today. <laughs> like, well, Which I, is often, by the way. <laughs> I do have to say, I laughed out loud. You talked about your grandmother saying to you, um, when you're talking about uh, love, and she said to you to make sure you find a man who loves you a little bit more than you love him. And I laughed out loud because my husband's aunt told me the exact same thing same before same. we got married. <laughs> and look, did it work? Did you marry somebody? Yes, I did. <laughs> look, look, look. So did I. <laughs> Absolutely, I did. But let's talk some specifics about ways you say that we we put on an act when we're in relationships. I mean, I think for me, it's it's hard because I have I've been with my husband since I was nineteen um, or turning twenty, like so, one hundred and five years. Which twenty? It's like dog years. <laughs> so like twenty years feels like one hundred and twenty years or whatever. Um, and I think he knew at that point in my life, I wasn't fully conformed over, but I was definitely more comfortable with who I was. So he knew exactly what he was getting himself into when he started dating you me. Know, or I was whatever. curious about that because I was wondering oh, yeah. if you became more outspoken after you got married or he really knew what was going on. Oh, no, he knew. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he knew. I, I love, you know, I'm, I'm going to say that I love my husband family. I'm very fortunate to have a wonderful relationship with them, as he does with mine. Mm -hmm. But I did walk into my father, which I, I don't know even if I put this in the book. My husband's family is religious. Father's side is religious Orthodox Jews. Oh. So I didn't even just walk into, like, Passover. I walked into, like, temple. Like, wow. full kosher home. Like, it was pretty, you know, his family came from a pretty religious background. So, as soon as we started dating, I wasn't racing to the altar at all. But we definitely, I'm not, I'm a communication person, clearly. So we definitely had a conversation, and it was kind of like, well, I don't know if my parents, you know, in other words, in a nicer way, I don't know if my parents are going to accept this relationship because you're not Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, oh, well, I've been down this road with my parents, so, like, this is, this is like a walk in the park. We'll <laughs> figure it out. But, no, he knew I was like this from the beginning because I was like, well, we need to address that. Because that's not going to work for me, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he knew that going into it. And I think that, I hope that it's made our relationship, my relationships with my friends and my husband stronger. Because when I feel a certain way, um, you know, I don't, I, you know, listen, every couple fights about their things. But he knows exactly what he's getting. Mm -hmm. He knows exactly what he's getting. He knows the type of person I am, what I like, what I don't like. And I think because I'm that way, our relationship is a lot easier and, you know, there's there's not a lot of, you know, hey, I'm going out with the girls tonight. All right, yeah, and by the way, I'm going to get super drunk, so just let me know. Don't go, you know, like, <laughs> just lay it all out there so that there's no surprises. And it's, I think it's made our relationship and my relationship with my friends, like, you know, I've had the same friends for 30 years, 35 years. I well, mean, you talk about in the book about a, a dinner party that you went to where oh, geez. the gentleman, um, <laughs> you became the very vocal. Let's put it that way. Yes. The cake. The cake. Oh, I'm always I'm terrible. You know how many times I've done that? I don't even have enough room in the book. Um, <laughs> no, it's sad. I, you know, I don't like injustices. 
Mm-hmm. I'm a big person who doesn't like injustices. So I don't speak for the sake of speaking unless I feel like it's warranted. So if I feel like someone's being belittled or judged or attacked, I'm very much the person that kind of gets in between it. Um, I don't know why. I think that if I feel like they're not able to defend themselves and it's such a disgusting situation that I'm not doing, I'm not doing, I, I'm not doing anything better for the world by not speaking up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always been that way. And I think when you're Ken and you're that type of person, it's a little like, uh, you know, people are like, oh my God. But when you're older and you have a little bit more cooth and a little bit more direction in your speaking, then it comes off a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that instance was, um, you know, I had to, I had to use fictitious, some fictitious names in the book so that nobody felt, so nobody felt, you know, attacked. But tell us the um, story. Tell but, us what happened. So yeah, I was sitting at a dinner party and, um, the, this person was, was, it was a maybe a group of about 25 of us. It was a holiday dinner and, uh, she had been dating somebody, an old, you know, not an older woman, but it, this isn't like my teen year. So she was probably in her fifties or forties and, uh, she had been dating somebody for a couple of years, and, um, you know, I kind of always felt this way about him. But, hey, you know, <laughs> not my chair, not my problem, <laughs> until it's my chair and my problem. <laughs> and we just sat down at dinner, and we were all just having coffee, and we started desserts, and everybody was, like, you know, so excited, and chocolate cake and ice cream and da 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 um, And we were just passing around the cake, and everyone had a piece of cake, and we just kept talking, and then everyone kind of was like, what else do we have for dessert? And she went to take a, piece, a second piece of cake, and her boyfriend said to her, and, uh, you know, it would be one thing to do this behind the scenes. I don't agree with it behind the scenes, but he's sitting at a dinner party with, like, 25 people. Mm-hmm. And loud enough for everybody to hear, he said, you know, do you really think you need that second cup of, that second piece of, of cake? You know, you're, you know, you're a little, you know, you're gaining a little here, and you, like, oh. insinuate it. Yeah, fully. I would have been and mortified. I thought to myself, <laughs> Well, could you imagine how, first of all, I would have decked my husband if he ever said that in front of me, which he never would, but I literally would have punched him. I really, like, who, and I thought to myself, she must feel as little as she possibly could right now, and everybody at the table heard it, and I said, I thought to myself, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it, like, 15 seconds. Somebody's mm-hmm. got to say something. Why do I always have to be the person that I'm thinking? <laughs> nobody's saying anything i'm just sitting there oh. and i'm like i literally just go in front of everyone. i go how i'm like you did not just say that to her i'm like i'm i'm like you just said you just insinuated and no you just blankly said she shouldn't have a second piece of cake because you think she's fat in front of 25 people wow how did he I'm react like, you know, there was some he just he did he just in his mouth i said to him you know that there was something severely wrong with you and not with her <laughs> and he looked at me and I was like, clearly you have an eating disorder, but why are you giving her one? And I just, and then I have to stop because it just keeps coming out. Like it's serious <laughs> Tourette. It's like Tourette. And I'm like, and then I stopped myself for a second because I had Brian's head down. My husband's head down. <laughs> I was going to say, what would Brian like looks down like, oh my gosh, here she goes oh, yeah. again, right? <laughs> That's exactly, a thousand percent, you nailed it right on the head. That's what he's thinking. And everyone else is just kind of like, I'm like, nobody can look down at their food any more than you guys all are. I'm like, you guys all heard this, and none of you were saying anything, but that, is there something so wrong with that? <laughs> and he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. For the rest of the night. <laughs> but here's, here's the thing. Okay, so when we talk about women being authentic with each other and being good friends, <sighs> what was her she reaction? Was she, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, funny enough, they broke up and she married somebody awesome, just got to say. They broke up <laughs> okay. like a month later. And guess whose house she came running through to sleep over? <laughs> Mine. Of course. <laughs> totally. I mean, I think at the moment, I'm not think. I'm thinking about the way that they're going to feel less than what they're feeling at that moment. Like, they're feeling it in that moment that they're also, like, loving the person that's saying that. Mm-hmm. It's a very, very, very fine line, and it's, it can be very, very, very hard. But I, I couldn't let, allow her without everybody knowing that this is a person that she's with. And this is years; they were seven years they were dating. So this wow. is a, this is built up over seven years that I never said anything when he would say really messed up things. And I just, I just, I was just like, you are losing your sense of self with this man. 
You are losing your sense of self. And I can't save you. You need to save yourself. But if you're going to do it in the company of other people and the presence of other people, then this is going to be the reaction. Whatever you do behind closed doors, that's your business. Mm -hmm. But I have two girls. I have kids. I don't want, you know, they're at the table. There are other young ladies at the table. And you're insinuating that she's had, it's just the whole thing sunk to high heaven. And I just couldn't sit there without saying something. I mean, there have been so many times I have done that. I, I countless times. I just did it the other day at the nail place. <laughs> I want to hear I that did. story in just a second. If you're just joining us, we're talking with Beth Thomas Cohen, and she is the author of the book Drop the Act, It's Exhausting, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. Have you had a change in the way that you approach life? Give us a call and let's talk about it, 440-2665 or one 800 nine four zero two two four zero so okay beth what happened at the nail salon so this is like this is like a week ago <laughs> i'm in the nail salon and i first of all i talk about the nail salon in the book the nail salon yeah. is just i don't understand it's like it's that and a hair salon is like a place for everyone to just have diarrhea of the mouth <laughs> i hear about parties how much money everyone has the size of their house uh, what political party they're involved in, I, everything that you don't want to hear, you hear at the nail place. That's like, I don't know why. Everyone just feels like it's like open space. Mm-hmm. So there was a, there, we, you know, and I like sitting there and not talking. And there was a woman that was getting her mat, a pedicure. And she turned to the woman that was working on her nails and said, I told you not to do that. Look at my nail. It's square. Are you stupid? Do you hear me? Do you understand wow. English? I was wow. like, no, okay. Now, I'm like, there, this is not, I'm not, some, like, there was, like, maybe three other people in the nail place. So I waited, like I always <laughs> do, wait for it. Nobody says anything. And she's like, you screwed up my nail. She's like, somebody else come over here. She doesn't even speak English. And, blah, blah, blah. and I turned to her. I'm like, do you hear yourself? Wow. Because if you heard yourself, I don't think you would like yourself. And so the other, so the woman next to me goes, yeah, that was really rude. So as soon as I start, people usually chime in. It's like the starting of it that nobody wants to do. And I just said to her, I'm like, this, you know, it's that whole injustice of, you know, well, she's like, well, she, I'm paying her to do. I'm like, are you kidding? You're digging yourself in a 17 foot hole right now. Stop talking. Mm. Because you just need to stop. It's things like that. And I just feel like that poor person sitting there who, for whatever reason, you know, it's a client service business. She's probably not, you know, doesn't want to have an argument with it with whoever, you know, mm-hmm. is saying this and, you know, that kind of thing. So I just, those are the things I just, we need to start doing that because people just, some, first of all, some people just can't. Some yeah. people just can't do it. And so I just have a tendency, you know, to just, to do that. And I feel so much, you know, I had a, an interview the other day and they said to me, if you died tomorrow, you have zero regret. Mm. And you know what I said? I'm like, you know what? I You're right. I don't. I have no regrets. I mean, you know, maybe I'd like to party a little harder before I go. No, I'm just kidding. But, like, you know, I feel like I've hopefully said everything that I felt like I needed to say what I needed to say. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping that that has an effect on how other people perceive things and, and make them, you know, kind of like food for thought mm-hmm. before, you know, they say things. But when you talk about oh, don't being in, um, in uh, um, a coffee shop, and the reaction that you get with oh, your daughter. God. So this, this particular instance, though, it, it made you, I guess your reaction, it I made you it. have to go back and think about how you're actually reacting to people. Can you tell us that story? I just had another one last week with that, too. And I, it's, wow. you know, nine out of ten, it's, nine out of ten. So my youngest daughter, um, my five-year-old, is like platinum blonde. Um, and, you know, extremely fair. I mean, she looks like she's sw- like off a Swiss Miss commercial. Like, I'm not <laughs> joking. She's full on Shiloh Pitt looking. Mm-hmm. Um, and my older one looks a little bit more like me. So Lila is my little one. And she, we, we get a lot of, we get a lot of, are you, you're her, you must be her nanny. You're not her mom. And I oh. get it all the time. And I get it in a metropolitan area. Like I'm eight miles outside of Manhattan. I lived okay. in the city for, I lived in the city for 18 years. You'd think living very in this kind of exposed, you know, focused business 
area that that wouldn't happen, um, wow. but it does, and it happens a lot. I nine out of ten times I'm you know, no, she's my daughter. You know, I know that she looks different than me. And then you'll catch me on an off day, and I go totally postal. Like it just it just I, it clicks me the wrong way. And in the book, I talk about a story when I was in I was six weeks post. Have just having her, so I hated everyone anyway. Um, and I, I mean, it, like you know, yeah, I'm not drinking, I'm breastfeeding, my boobs are bleeding, I'm bleeding. I hate my husband. I hate everyone. I'm miserable. I'm fat. I'm gross. It's everything. And so I should have stayed home. <laughs> That's the bottom line: is I should have stayed home, but I did. Every woman who's had a child can relate to what you just said. <laughs> I mean, I was disgusting. I was, I didn't even know who I was. Plus, I was just angry at the world because my hormones were like messed up. Um, and so I, I venture, you know, I, oh, yay, let me venture out to Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks, wherever I was. And uh, I was in line for coffee, and someone said, oh, you know, she's so beautiful. I'm like, oh, thank you so much, thinking like, oh, you know, I'm so glad I came out, you know. <laughs> And then she said to me, she's so beautiful. You're so lucky. Like, I would, you, you know, you must be the nanny. And you get the nanny oh. for, like, the cutest girl ever or something like that. Oh. And I, like I said, nine out of ten times, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. The tenth time, I just had the tenth time two weeks ago again. And I looked at her and I said, well, you must be in line for donuts because you're 450 pounds. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God, I need to go to jail right now. Someone needs to put a muzzle on me. There is something wrong with me. I have clearly had a kid and lost my mind. I just insulted somebody about their weight. I'm not that person. Oh, my God. I mean, I felt you can't even. The self-loathing was enough to kill me. I mean, I got out of line. I looked at her. I don't even think I apologized because I was so mortified that I even would even talk to somebody like that. It's everything against what I believe in. And I, mar- I marched, I walked back with the stroller in the city, back to my apartment, hysterically crying. And it was a weekend, and I opened the door, and I said, to- and I told Brian the story, and he looked at me and goes, you're crazy, dude. You have lost your mind. And I'm like, I seriously have. I'm cra- you can't let me out. Don't let me out of the house. Like, I can't, I can't do it. Like, I can't, don't. And I called my mom, which I don't think I put in the book. Um, mm-hmm. I called my mom, and my mom is the one with blonde hair and blue eyes. And I said, Mom, you know, da da da. And she said to me, You need to stop crying. And I'm like, Okay. She's like, Do you? I don't want to hear it. Do you know what I dealt with in 1976 with you and Daddy mm-hmm. and me? She's like, Come on. This is the world we live in, Beth. I'm sorry you have to deal with this 30 years after I dealt with it, but build a bridge and get over it. I was wow. like, Okay, okay, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, she was just like, um, she was flabbergasted that it still went on. But she was right. It was the kind of thing where, like, this is the car. This is this. I chose this. This is what I have. I love what I have. And if you don't understand what I have, then then I then I just got to get over it. But it does. It happened happened two weeks ago. I took the girls. They take a skating class in in a, you know, urban, suburban area, like mix of people and that's where they go skating. I grew up going to the skating rink and the instructor said it was kind of being like kind of standoffish with me and I was trying to talk to her about sharpening Lila's skates and she just said to me, he goes, Well you're the nanny, tell the mom. Oh gosh. You know, that must really I, get I, under I, your skin. I, I can well, I can I see how that it. would get under your I skin. Lost, I lost it at that part too. But that's the yeah. second time and it hadn't happened in like five years. <laughs> say then about our society i mean your mother as you said back in the 70s you were born she was white your father was black yep they had to, yep. you 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 can kind of picture what they went through are you surprised that in 2015 somebody's still calling you the nanny i mean our i talk about it in the book too like i know that i'm gonna get slack for this because i've been saying this out in the media a lot <laughs> Our society hasn't changed. We're just really politically correct, and we're good at hiding things. That's how I see it. Like, Mm -hmm. I see it like when you're out in the open, you want to be politically correct, and you want to be this person, but behind closed doors, you're still the racist that you are. People just don't know. 
Mm -hmm. we just hide it better. That's what I think it is. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Like, I married a Jewish boy, and I'm mixed religion and race, and I see it from every different sector. I've been with, I've been with, you know, Caucasian people, and they'll talk about African American people. I've been with, um, mm -hmm. I've been with African American people who talk about people who are Jewish. I've been with Jewish people who talk about people who are not Jewish. I mean, I see it from every different area because nobody really knows what I am, mm -hmm. and. It's, it's, I think we just hide it better. So 30 years ago, nobody worried about calling somebody a racist name because everybody was doing it. Now everybody knows it's not right. So instead, they just do it when the doors are closed with their friends or at their home and their family. And mm -hmm. then they put up a facade. They, they put up an act when they're out in the general public. So no, I, I don't think we've evolved. I mean, okay, I can't say at all because that would just sound uneducated. Yes, have we evolved in some way? We have an African-American president. Thank God. But... <laughs> Really, at the end of the day, no, we haven't evolved. Mm. We have not evolved, not to the point where I feel like we should 30 years later. Mm. I mean, it just is still running rampant. I'm Barbara Hamley, and you're listening to Another View. So let me ask you, Beth, about um, turning 40. The 40 is the new oh, 20, geez, the and the, is the 60 20. is the new 60 is the new 40. <laughs> <laughs> and you talk a lot no, about, <laughs> about how women spend a lot of time trying to fight Mother Nature. And, and that that's not Ugh. necessarily your your take on it, huh? Well, it, it, I, uh, yes and no. Okay, I'm not saying... My problem is, if you want to do certain things to yourself, I am all for a nip and a tuck. Go ahead, do it. But why do we have to say that... Why do we have to equate that as... 40 is the new 20. Why can't it just be 40 is 40, and here's what I'm fixing? Like, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's setting up some sort of parameter that you have to be like, in, no, 40 is not the new 20. Do, does your, do your boobs look like they did when you were 20 <laughs> when you're 40? Because I'm sorry. I don't care if you had a kid or didn't have a kid. Your kids don't look the same. They your did body years does ago. change. Yes, it does. <laughs> and I don't care what. What goes on? So it's impossible to be 40 and have that be 20. That's just my, my point. So I don't, I still believe you want to nip tuck, Botox, Juvederm, whatever it is that you want to do. I just think that instead of saying, you know, 40 is a new 20 or 60 is a new 40, kind of like why can't we just be comfortable with, at the age that we're at? Mm -hmm. why, why are we trying to, be, you know, I, I think, you know, prolonging, the inevitable is something that we all do, especially, you know, because you're in the media, too, mm -hmm. in the media world, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. But I think, yeah, but issue the disclaimer and be like, yo, I just got Botox last week. What do you think? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, don't hide it and be like, I'm just this good. <laughs> no, you're not. Like, so, so no, but, you're not. But your generation, I thought, because I'm a little bit older than you, um, was the generation that, you know, just kind of let it all hang out. You really didn't care whether uh, you looked a certain uh, way or you acted a uh, certain uh, way. Not true. Mm -mm -mm. No. <laughs> no. No. My God, no. I mean, think about who we have to look up to. <laughs> oh, no, I'm getting that terrible. <laughs> yes, because those That's baby so boomers did do that. Absolutely, we did. But... You know what I mean? <laughs> but, like, no. I just, I don't think, I think that this is, this is the tie, and I did a huge piece um, this was uh, InStyle covered this. InStyle.com covered this chapter. This has been a really like interesting chapter. The 40 is the new 20 mm -hmm. chapter. Which when I wrote it, I, I I'm so obsessed with race and judgment. This happens to be such a hot topic. But I don't think our generation. I think we just we just navigate it differently. Like think about it. Mm. With this, this is tying it back to social media. It's kind of like, um, you know. <laughs> The, the 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 wanting to be prettier and skinnier and this and that whatever it is that doesn't go away with age so anybody that says that it's i mean yeah maybe you know in another 20 or 30 years but at my in my generation you're mm -hmm. still striving for something you're still striving for the perfection whether or not it be parenting or career or love like you're still for some reason the bar is just that higher in my generation i think and mm -hmm. I don't even know what could happen with, with my kids. I fear wow. for my kids. I do. I fear. I have a, a nine-year-old, like I said, who, who said to me, Mommy, am I fat? I almost dropped dead. Wow. I you... said, where are you even hearing this? 
Mm -hmm. Oh, at school. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, oh, my God. And the, th you know, the question just, is, who's, who is talking to young ladies about this? You know what I'm saying? Their, In other words, that's where parents, else did they get it from? Exactly. Exactly. For parents, it's like such, it's, the, it's so interesting and now that I'm like reliving, having the book out and reliving my childhood through my, my girls, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. especially because I have girls and kind of really even taking a deeper look at myself in the world because I have girls and reliving it with them and I just even last night she was crying because so and so wouldn't talk to her because she's friends with. I, I just thought to myself, oh my God, girls are just horrible. And it's the same girls and it's the moms I cannot stand. It's the same exact cycle. And I thought it's just, it's so interesting because it, I, I attribute such a huge amount of my thinking and success to my parents. Mm -hmm. I do. I do, and I, I, it, it starts in the home. It doesn't have to stay in the home, but it starts right. at home. Right. All of it, judgment, racism, views, fat sins, focus, any of that, in the home. You in talk, the home. You know, and, and the other thing that I thought was really interesting that you brought up was the whole idea of teaching our kids that it is, um, that you don't, if, you, if you're failing at something, um, then we're oh, going to yeah, take away that. <laughs> right, you just stop doing it. You're, we're going to take away that option so that you will yeah. feel good about yourself. That's not. You yeah. don't believe that's how you build self-esteem. So I it, really don't. I really don't. I I was watching the news last night on like Fox News up here, and they had a segment about. I, I just was like, yes, but about how um, how this whatever particular person they were talking about thinks that kids need to learn to lose. Yeah, you got to lose. You can't get a trophy for losing. It, 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 it's mind-boggling to me to be like, here, you know, you lost, you won, but you all get trophies. Right. For what? Because life you is lost. not like that. Um, hello? Life <laughs> hello. Is, and, and, uh, let's, let's set up our kids to always feel like even if they lose, or whatever, or fail, that, they're, that they'll still be... No, because then they're <laughs> going to get out to the real world and think, why can't I always win? Exactly. Like, it doesn't work that way. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> We're talking with Beth Thomas-Cohen, author of Drop the Act, It's Exhausting. Anita joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, Anita. You're on the air. I, I just wanted to say thank you for this show, and thank you for taking my call. And what a refreshing guest you have on and I feel like I just want to say yay because there's, oh. another, person, there's another person out there that's just like me and sometimes yay. It's, thanks Anita <laughs> sometimes it's very hard to live our lives because we're so outspoken and it just stops people in their tracks and yes. you just have to come to you know I had to come to the realization I think I was about 35 when I realized that some people are going to love me and some people are going to hate me based on their conception of who they thought I was. Mm. Yes. Mm. And who they are. Interesting. Who they are. I've, just, I've continued. And, of course, now I'm 60. I'm afraid that it's gotten worse, my outspokenness. <laughs> God help me by the time I'm 70. <laughs> <laughs> Anita, thank you so much for the call. We really appreciate it. <laughs> But I understand what she's saying because now some people will say, Beth, that that this outspokenness, this this kind of um, I know. filterless I way, know what you're gonna say. is just no, but it's just a part of getting older. That you know, when you, when you hit your fifties, um, people know. say, you know what, you don't care anymore because you've been through it and you just don't care anymore. I know, but my point is, why are we waiting until we're fifty? Got gotcha. you. You know, why are we mm -hmm. waiting to feel that way until we're fifty? That's you know, that's a good 30 years you wasted <laughs> waiting to be, to be like, why are we waiting till we're 50? You know, it, it just, it seems crazy. It really seems crazy to me. And I just think that, you know. Hello? I don't, oh, take, there you go. I don't take a particular position in the book. I basically open up a can of worms and say, you know, discuss. Talk amongst yourselves because I don't take a particular judgment on things. What I'm hoping is that people will realize there is a way to do this. There is, I don't think everyone should just diarrhea of the mouth of every thought that comes to their head and just spewing it. You know, right. I don't. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying.
thresholds. One is if you feel a certain way about something, then there is a way to convey your feelings with cooth and from a place of yes, not a place of no, not a negative place. Gotcha. And on top of that, instead of hiding behind, you know, for me in, in the area that I live in, unfortunately, I, I toy with it every day. There's, there's a group of, of not uh, specific women, just in general women who, you know, kind of feel like they have a lot of money or their husband has a lot of money and they're just they're responsible for the kids and they want to have the perfect life, perfect wife, perfect house, perfect car, perfect clothes. And it's like they're clones of each other and they don't know how to. And I think if they allowed themselves to be who they really were, then mm -hmm. they wouldn't feel like they needed safety in numbers and they wouldn't worry about being an oddity. And I think that's a lot of the facades people put up and they build those walls and then they just go through life. And then they, you know, they never have the chance to say, like, do I really am I really who I want to be? Do I really want to be friends with these people? Do I really want to be exactly like them? Do I want to do everything? Same school and same church or same temple or same, you know, everything is just easy. Right. You know, mm -hmm. just because you've conformed to whatever norm that is. And Instead those of are being the two yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. those are the two big, big messages. Let's see. Jan Dan joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Dan. You're on the air. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Sure. I really, I love this topic of conversation because I am a chaplain's kid, uh, born, you know, Navy brat, the whole nine yards. So basically why I said that is myself and my family, wonderful people that they were, were social face. I was taught at four and five years old, you put on the social face, and you, hi, how are you, and, you know, all this kind of good stuff. Social you know, face, yeah. What, you, what mm -hmm. you're thinking sometimes, you know, gee, I wish you hadn't said that, or gee, whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I, I found out right. later, and I admire your strength. I really do, and I, I admire my adopted brother and sister-in-law because I'm an only child. I tell everybody I'm the best advertising of birth control in 53 years. <laughs> <laughs> my sister-in-law is just like you in the fact that, you know what, she's going to let you know what she thinks. And I think people respect that a lot more than folks like myself who just sit back and say, oh, well, okay, you take care. Have a good day. Got you. I found out later in life, and I'm 53, by this older Southern lady, my mother was from North Carolina, that we Southerners can say anything bad about anybody we want to, as long as we say bless their heart. <laughs> <laughs> like, look at that little boy coming up. Isn't he the ugliest thing you ever saw? Bless, Bless your heart. heart. Bless your heart. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> oh, thanks. You know what? Dan, I thanks love so that. much for that call. I love that. <laughs> and you know what? He has a point because that I've heard that many, many times. So I want to ask you, that. we've got about four minutes left. And believe me, this hour has flown by. But I want to ask know. you, Beth, what act are you still working on to drop? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> every single one of them. Every different, different one every day. I think the one thing that I have really come full circle um, is, 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 is being able to communicate my feelings about things in a, in a way that doesn't hurt anybody's feelings, but really from a good place and wanting to communicate so that we could get to a, a deeper place in our relationship. Mm, give me an example. I feel like that I've pretty much, um, I think they would agree with that too. Mm -hmm. Every single thing in my book, I still have to work on. Every wow. single thing. I mean, I will catch myself, you know, being in a situation with one of the people I feel like needs to drop the act. And then all of a sudden I'm putting up an act because they're not dropping their act. And I have to check myself. And I'm like, wait a minute, who am I? Wait, no, 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 no. I don't want to be that person. Back up, back up, back up. And I walk out of the conversation, I'm like, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. I just right. stoop to your level. And like, yeah, oh, my God, I work on, I have to work on myself and all of the acts that, you know, I, I, they're dropped. They are. But I can always bring one back up. And I, I have to work on all of them. Oh, no. All of them. So, Every day I try. So what do you tell people, or especially women, who want to start to drop the act? I mean, you're right. You just don't wake up one morning and say, I'm never going to mm -hmm. act again. I'm going to just be who I am. So what do you advise them to do to get started? I feel like, you know, you know, everyone always says, go with your gut, go with your gut. Like mm -hmm. there is a huge, I believe in that wholeheartedly. And so if there is a part of you that feels a certain way about something and is generally wants to suppress that feeling, feel it for a second. It might not be pleasant, but 
feel it for a second because I think if you stop for a minute when you're feeling your gut like that, you'll realize whatever it is that you want to convey or communicate or not say or say or decide um, will, will then eventually help you drop the act because you'll, you'll recognize something that you normally don't, A, want to recognize or don't recognize. But if you take that moment and you think you feel your gut and you're just like, you know, something feels off about it, like, stop for a second and try to figure out maybe what that is. And I think eventually it'll start to happen when, when someone speaks to you a certain way and you've just accepted it for so long and then all of a sudden you realize this isn't really what I want or you know that it's there but you don't want to address it. Mm-hmm. Just try. Okay. You'll feel so liberated. <laughs> Absolutely. And one last question I have for you, and that is yeah. which one do you prefer, red or white? Red! <laughs> Red too. <laughs> Absolutely. But I'm, not, but, I'm, but I'm not. But I'm not. I, you know, I'm an equal opportunist. <laughs> <laughs> the book is called "Drop the Act." It's exhausting. Beth, where can we find it? Um, uh, everywhere. Um, Amazon.com is probably the easiest. Barnes and Nobles, Walmart, Target, and probably I mean maybe one of your little book specialty stores. Okay. And what's yeah. your web? Then tell us your website. Website is BethThomasCohen.com, and then my social media, I have uh, Twitter and Instagram I'm crazy obsessed with, and Beth is at BethThomasCohen. Okay. Thank you so very much for joining us here on Another View. We really appreciate it, and we are all going to work on dropping the act. (laughs) You take care, Beth. (laughs) Thanks, Barbara. You take care, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Claude McKnight of Group Take 6, and you're listening to Another View, Fridays at noon at WHRV 89.5 FM. What a delightful person, Beth Thomas Cohen. In today's technological world, the need for students to understand science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, is crucial. In an effort to help meet this need, Hampton Roads native and music superstar Pharrell Williams established a nonprofit foundation for underserved youth. Our Lisa Godley takes a look at his program, From One Hand to Another. Virginia Beach native Pharrell Williams has proven himself as a giant in the music industry. And the Grammy Award-winning singer, songwriter, and producer has made it a point to give back to the community he calls home. What education does is it provides you more than just the information. It it also gives you a how-to. It it also gives you invaluable application uh, that you get from studying different techniques. In 2008, Williams established a program right here in Hampton Roads. He named it From One Hand to Another. The curriculum is designed to supplement a child's education with tutoring, motivational lessons, and learning activities. Louisa Strayhorn is the program's executive director. Pharrell felt it was important to start with those that perhaps had more needs than others. And so we are working our way through using the designation of Title I schools first, but by no means do we ever turn down any child that wants to go to our camp. Pharrell's mother, Dr. Carolyn Williams, serves as the chairwoman of the board for From One Hand to Another, as well as the director of education. We know that even if you are not quote-unquote, underserved, there still may be some interest or some opportunities that can definitely assist. So we are open to everyone, but we started initially there to try and create a foundation, a basis of working with the children, but definitely wanting to inspire those individuals. Strayhorn says their mission is to change the world one child at a time by providing them with the tools and resources they need to meet their unique potential. She calls it stopping the brain drain. We in this country do not really have the luxury of throwing away any child. We need every single one of them in order to make this country great. So for me, that mission is so, so important, but it is one of those where I am lucky enough to be involved in trying to make sure 
that we reach as many children as possible. Strayhorn says once a child enters the program, they want to make sure they not only learn something, but have fun doing it. Children are tested so much with the SOLs and number of things that they have um, no one to point out to them the really fun things that can be done, that can keep them interested in learning. And so our project-based program really give them an opportunity not to just stare at somebody's face, but to actually put their hands on a project and create something for themselves. So I think we're excited that this seems to be working. The program focuses on science, technology, engineering, arts, math, and motivation, or STEAM, and partners with other educational institutions like NASA to create interesting and engaging programs like the one they call Rockets to Race Cars. We use the race car to teach the children math and friction and all of the different terms and what speed means. We allow the children the opportunity to be able to build their own business and actually do presentations on what it is like Shark Tank. Dr. Williams estimates that from one hand to another helps about 3,000 students a year. She says her son is really adamant about learning. Being the visionary that he is, he has lots of ideas and he puts the ideas out there, but then garner the assistance of other individuals who can help bring his vision to pass. And so he leaves that up to us to really make a difference. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And the story you just heard, From One Hand to Another, was produced by Another View intern Gillian Bullock, a senior at Norfolk State University. Thank you so much for listening to Another View today. If you'd like to hear the show again or share it with a friend, please visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. You can also sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a -a once-a-week reminder of upcoming shows. And you can also find us on Facebook, and I'm at Barbara Ham Lee on Twitter. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Kamaria Mason answered our phones. On behalf of the entire Another View crew, we wish you love, peace, prosperity, and happiness this holiday season. On Christmas Day next week, enjoy special holiday programming. And then join us on New Year's Day for a look back at our favorite positive stories of 2015. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thanks for joining us, and happy holidays, everyone. We'll see you next time for another view.